places. Daniel 1, look at verse 3. We're going to read through verse 8 together. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. For some people, this is their grandkids, right? No blemish. Everything's perfect. Verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart. They would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, and the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. We'll stop there. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we preach tonight. Lord, we need you. I pray you'd stir our hearts, what you have for us from your word. And I pray, Lord, that most of all, you'd be pleased. And I know, Lord, it's a different service tonight. Lord, small number, but there's no accidents with you. And you have something for us from your word. May we give, us your, may we, may we give you our full attention, our undivided attention these next moments. And ask you, Lord, now to speak to my heart and our hearts here present. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. You know, we come to this time of year and people are thinking about, boy, I ate a lot over Christmas. <laughs> uh, they're thinking about some resolutions for the new year. Man, this house, we've got to get some organization done. Or, oh, we've got to work on uh, uh, exercise or we've got to do you know, something new, this new program or whatever. I was uh, reading through a list of popular New Year's resolutions and, of course, the typical ones, uh, top the list, quit smoking. I hope many of you are going to take that challenge. And uh, get out of debt, that's a good one. We're among the most popular, that's typical. Losing weight, right near the top, and exercising as well. But there's a few resolutions, or some resolves, if you will, even that Daniel made in his day that could benefit us in the new year. I want to think about three resolves here from Daniel and then three resolutions from Psalm 40. You say, what's the difference? Well, the resolve is a guiding principle. It's a guiding principle. And I think all of us should adopt these three I'm going to share with you. And then there's three resolutions. Those are specific plans that God would lead you to make in the new year. Uh, just like every year, every moment of our life, every day of our life belongs to the Lord. We're stewards, aren't we? Just stewards. And so what does God have for me in 2018? Some of us didn't think we'd ever see 2018, you know, but here we are. What does God have for us in 2018? And so from Daniel chapter 1, we're going to look at these three resolves, and then Psalm 40, uh, we're going to look at these three resolutions. And so Daniel made resolutions worth remembering. You know, a lot of people by February, they've forgotten even what the resolutions were. Um, but as you're thinking about what God would have for you in this new year, Daniel resolved to make a difference in his generation. He resolved that he's going to make a difference for his generation. I want to say three. Number one, first resolve was he resolved to restore character. Resolved to restore character. I want you to notice verse three and four. The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of king's seed and of princes, children whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. 
Now, society today is suffering from a lack of character, a lack of moral integrity. And uh, you can't even turn on a sports channel hardly without hearing some type of scandal, some type of cheating, uh, some type of um, some player made a touchdown and made vulgar gestures, some type of just on, on and on like that. Uh, and so, you, you know, it just it's through our society from one side to the other. You go to look for a job and you've got to have a drug test and you've got, I mean, just everything. They're just, people don't have character. People aren't people that, uh, of integrity like it should be. And so people are cheating in sports. They've got to have so many rules and so many cameras and check everything because people will cheat. They've got to check them when they come out, make sure they don't have something. Uh, not too long ago in the baseball season, people having something on their helmet and putting something on the ball when they're pitching. Uh, you know, just all types of different ways to get an advantage because they don't have moral integrity. Here these young Israelites are away from home. Probably their parents have been killed. But the least they know they're never going to see Jerusalem again, and they would not. They never would see Jerusalem again. The, the, everything they knew has been ransacked. Or they saw Jerusalem destroyed. Um, they saw the king and uh, the, all his armies defeated. They saw uh, that what the prophets had warned for years and years has happened. Jerusalem, their hometown. And now they're young. These are young men. These are children, they call them. We don't know exactly their age, but they're young men. And here are probably teenagers, something like that. But now they're offered a whole new life. In fact, I'm sure if these Chaldeans, if, if, if uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, they would have their way, these men would forget even how anything they'd been taught before, and they would totally take on the life and lifestyle of the Chaldean way. Uh, if you notice here, uh, not only are they giving them a new name, uh, they're changing their diet, uh, they're going to train them up in the ways of the Chaldeans, it says. They want to teach them in the end of verse 4. They might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And so they could have gotten away with anything. Their parents would have never known. Like I said, likely their parents had been killed. But character, if we're going to have a resolve to restore character, character isn't what you do when the lights are on. Character is what you do when the lights are out. Character isn't what you do in public. Character is what you do in private. You know, God knows what you would do. God knows what I would do if I could get away with it. God knows what you would do if you could get away with it. If, if no one would know, what would you do? What's in your heart to do? See, we need a resolve to restore character that I'm going to do right whether anyone ever knows I did right or not. Or whether, whether anyone's watching me or not. Boys, girls, we've got girls on this side, boys on this side. Yeah, children, young people here. Girls, you looking here? This is something that's good for obeying your parents, whether they're watching or not. You put away your toys, right? Whether you're watching or not, you don't yell or cheat in a game or, or argue or fight or hit each other. Uh, that's character. See, a resolve to do to back to moral character, a resolve to restore character. I think about how bosses, they're afraid to leave employees and what was going to happen. I can only imagine. Uh, I, th I think Brother Smithini thinks he has a good team there at Big Lots, but uh, some of the things that I'm sure supervisors, if they're not watching, what will happen? They have, uh, you, uh, we were um, at uh, shooting range uh, with a couple of my uh, brother-in-laws, and uh, they have cameras watching everything, watching the till, watching the shooting range, watching what you're doing. You go to any uh, register where the, it's not a, necessarily watching what what, what I'm doing as the customer, but what the employee is doing inside the till. You go to the self-checkout now at Walmart, if you notice they've added where they, you see yourself on camera, and because they, people are stealing stuff, I guess, I'm sure. And so it's just on and on like this in our society. So we need to resolve that whether everyone else is stealing, whether everyone else is going to eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine, I'm going to do right. We need to resolve to restore character. Oh, how our nation needs it, how our churches need it. Our families need character. Then number two, or how about a resolve to resist culture? A resolve to resist culture. Daniel 1, 5 through 7 says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah. Daniel 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, of Meshach, and to Azariah, of Abednego. You know, culture isn't easy to resist today. It's on the billboards, it's on TV commercials, it's on mainstream music, I mean, constantly on the attack, this culture. Resisting culture is easier said than done. But culture wasn't easy to resist in Daniel's day. It's a whole new culture. He's, he's, I mean, you read some of what Babylon did and the way their worship was, the false gods and the immorality and some of the things that they would have seen. And it was wicked. Their culture was wicked. And here it's being pushed upon them. And, and, and it would have been easy to say, well, I'm just going to start over. It's just a new life. You know, Jehovah didn't protect us. My parents are dead. It would have been easy to say that. The Babylonian powers are forcing their gods on them, forcing their culture, their language, their diet, their names, trying to change everything. But Daniel resolved to resist culture. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous, into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. See, if we expect to do anything for God in our day, we're going to have to resist culture. If we expect to do anything to change our generation, we're going to have to resist the culture we see in our day. And third, we're going to have to resolve to refuse conforming. Resolve to refuse conforming. Before I get into the third point, let me just say one more thing about resisting culture. Uh, one thing that's a new culture in, I say new, but this culture even in churches, where a church that believes the Bible and Christians that believe the Bible and say, I'm going to live after, it's almost extinct. To find people that say, I'm going to live according to this book. I'm going to conduct my life. I'm going to read this with the idea I'm going to live it. It's almost a foreign thing. I mean, here we live in the South, but you find a lot of churches where Christians uh, or so-called Christians, that their life is no different than the person that works beside them that's not in church on Sunday and doesn't claim to be a Christian. And it's, it's unbelievable. This is the first generation that have called themselves Christians whose life is not any different. They live just like their neighbor. They live just like the world. And so we are going to be backward and look very much against culture if we're going to say, I'm going to live as a biblical Christian. But God has called us to this discipleship, to this life, to this new life in Christ. And so I'm going to have to choose. Am I going to follow culture? Am I going to follow the trend while well, other Christians are doing it? Well, good night. There were other children besides Daniel and Azariah and Mishael and Hananiah. There were other Hebrew children. God gives us these four that took a stand, but there were others that bowed to the idol in Daniel chapter 3. There were others that ate the king's meat, and drank his wine. The Bible doesn't tell us about them. They, they, they did not resist the culture. And these weren't the only four taken. And so, what are we going to do? The question isn't what everyone else is doing. What am I going to do? What am I going to do with what the Bible says? Am I going to be a biblical Christian? I'm not going to stand before God for what everyone else did in my generation. I'm going to stand before God for what I did. What am I going to do? Resolve to resist culture. Third one is resolve to refuse conforming. Resolve to refuse conforming, Daniel 1, verse 8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now I'd imagine it had been fairly easy to give in. Just say, you know what, I'm just going to go with it. This is where we're at. I don't know what he thought was going to happen, but it could have cost him his life. The guy that was over him was afraid for his own life if he let him eat what he was asking. He could have been kicked out of the program. These were going to be the favored. These were going to be the princes. Uh, these were going to be the ones that would stand before the king. Uh, Babylon, uh, or, or yes, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar would come back to Israel and take other um, captivity. 
Uh, they would take other groups, but the first time all they took were the well-favored, the best, the ones with no blemishes, the smart, the ones that could understand and learn. And so he could have been kicked out of that group and said, fine, you're working the mines or working whatever. He didn't know what was going to happen. could have cost him his life. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he resolved, I'm not going to conform. I'm not going to bow to the world. I'm not going to agree to this. It's against what I believe is right, what God's word says is right. I'm not going to give in. There was no parents there. There was no pastor there. There was no uh, godly influences. But he didn't conform to the wicked lifestyle of the Babylonians. You know, swimming against the current is not easy to do, but swimming against the current makes you stronger. It puts some resolve in you. Uh, Paul advocates, advocated swimming against the culture's current. This one he wrote, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so here, Paul's saying the world is going to try to conform you to fit into this mold, but don't, don't do it. Don't go along with the world. Let the Lord transform you. Let him transform you into what you find in the word of God that a Christian should be. Let him transform you into someone that would be like Christ in their integrity, in their character, not like the culture. So will you be conformed or transformed? What are your goals for this year, 2018? I encourage you, follow the example of Daniel as you strive to make a difference this year in your generation. And so as you think about these, I would adopt these resolves. Lord, I want to resolve to restore character. You say, I'd like to restore character in all the young people I see around. Well, you can't do that. You can try to begin to lead them, but you have to first say, I'm going to be a person of character. I am going to be someone that's honest, a person of integrity according to the Word of God. Then I'm going to resolve to resist culture. I'm not going to go along just because all the world and everyone else is doing it. I'm going to be biblical in my Life. You cannot be spiritual without being scriptural. Then I'm going to resolve to refuse to conform, refuse conforming. I'm not going to conform to the world. I'm going to every day get in this book and say, I want to be like the Lord Jesus and follow his steps. There's three resolves. Let me give you three resolutions. Go to Psalm 40. Would you with me, please? Psalm 40. We're going to read verses 1 to 10. Psalm chapter 4, or Psalm 40, I should say. Verses 1 to 10. Would you look there? I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me <laughs> and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. And respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. There's many people turn aside to lies. God says, blessed is him that doesn't. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. Think of it. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Just three resolutions I want you to consider. First of all, meditation. Meditation. Right in the beginning, he talks about salvation. Verse 2, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Now, one of the things I think that many people today 
have, the reason they don't view their salvation as valuable as we should is we, did, we don't ever see ourselves in the miry pit. Uh, we, we did, well, we weren't that bad. I mean, I wasn't really that bad, you know. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't in drugs or I hadn't killed anybody or I hadn't. But God says he brought me up out of a miry pit. You were on your way to hell. You were a sin, uh, sinful and hell-deserving sinner. But the Lord loved you. Think of what he did for you. He pulled you out of the miry pit. He says he set your feet upon a rock. That rock is Jesus. And established my goings. And he put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. You know, our life, is, as Peter talked about, is supposed to be peculiar. We're supposed to be a, a holy nation, a, a royal priesthood. Uh, our life ought to cause people to see it and fear and trust the Lord. Our life ought to be that spectacular, that amazing, that not because we're amazing, but our God is, and He's called us to a whole different life than this culture, this world, what people of our day and your family and, and people that live next door to you or people that you work with, he's called us to something totally different than that. And so our life ought to cause, think of what he's saying here. He put a new song in my mouth, something no one else knew. This is different than the world. Even praise unto our God and many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. Well, if I, you know, got too fanatical about everything, I wouldn't have any fun. My life would be a mess, you know, it would just be too much. God says, blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. What about the New Year saying, I'm just going to go all the way with God. I'm going to, I'm going to open this book and read it every day, and what I find it, I'm going to live. I'm going to do. I'm going to be obedient to the Holy Spirit of God and be filled with the Spirit as He says and whatever He leads me to do, I'm going to do. I'm just going to mark it down. I'm going to decide. This is my resolution. What would God have you make in this area of meditation? First of all, if you're not saved, you, you need to be saved. But I think we need to, many of us here are saved, I know, tonight. I think we need to remember again what God has done for us in our salvation. You were bad. I was in a pit. I was headed down to the bottomless pit to hell is where I was headed. And yet what he's done for me, I owe him everything. Then under meditation, once you think about just that, look at verse 4 through 6. Bless that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud. Nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare... And speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. Think of it. Here he is, waiting on the Lord, the psalmist here. Praying. He's seeking the Lord. He's trusting. He's listening. His ears are opened, he says in verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. My ears are opened. He's reading. He's meditating. He's uh, making the Word a part of him. He's applying it to his life. Read verse 7 and 8. Think of what he says here. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. You say, well, he's memorizing Scripture. Well, I, I, I would agree with you. I think that's part of it. But I think it's more than that. I think it includes memorization, but I think... It's application. He's literally making the Word of God a part of him. It's becoming what he lives out, this book. He says, you've opened my eyes, you've opened my ears, you've helped me to see. I I'm coming in the volume of the book, it's written, I, I delight to do thy will. Well, where in the world do I find the will of God? You find the will of God in the Word of God. I delight to do your word, literally what he's saying. The New Testament, James said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So he says, thy law is within my heart. He says, I'm going to live out this book. How we need to spend time with the Lord. Specific, daily time with God. 
I'm excited. Our girls have been reading, reading the Bible and have had other encouragers, not just Mary and I, but others of the, their teachers at school and different ones. Mary and I, of course, encourage them as well. And uh, I pay them to read the Bible. You may not agree with that, but I do. Uh, every time they finish a book of the Bible, they get a dollar, and so they got a list there, and I'm happy to pay. Other people pay their kids to clean their house or do whatever. I don't know. But, uh, hey, I'm glad to give them a dollar every time they finish a book of the Bible. And uh, they have to read them all. They can't they have to only check off. They can't just read Obadiah every time. But, um, uh, you know, I was saying to some of my sister brother-in-law about, uh, you know, how they've read through the Bible a couple times, some of them. And uh, that's exciting to me. I didn't read through the Bible the first time until I was in high school. And there's a lot of Christians that sit in churches, been saved for years, have never read through the Bible. And so, first off, if I'm going to have this meditation, what, and I'm going to pray, Lord, what do you want me to do in my New Year's resolution? What do you want me to consider in this area, specifically? Remember I said a resolve is a guiding principle, but a resol resolution is making a specific plan. So, uh, in this area, my life, my personal meditation with the Lord, what is my specific plan? What did God have you do? I, I encourage you to make a plan. Ask the Lord, what would you have me do in this area? Well, I can't live the word. I can't understand what God is t speaking from his book. I can't delight to do his will if I'm not just, I mean, as an entry-level thing, I'm not at least reading the Bible every day. I'm not studying his word. I'm not praying. I'm not seeking him. Here the psalmist, he's, verse 1, waiting patiently for the Lord. He's praying. He's talking to the Lord. He, he inclined, the Lord inclines unto me. He hears my cry. He says, uh, he's, he's in his word here. We've, we've read through all the way to the verse 8, all these different things he's talking about. He's meditating. He's praying. He's seeking. He's listening to the Lord. His ears are now open. He's hearing. He's communing with his God. And so if we don't, we're not at least doing that every day, we're never going to be the Christian God would have us be. Not going to happen. And so what, what does God want me to do in this area? Personally, me, you, would you ask him? Would you say, Lord, what do you want me the specific plans I need to make in this area of meditation. And secondly, maturation. Look at verse 6. Sacrifice and offerings thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burn offerings and sin offering hast thou not required. Now, this is interesting. From the early age of any Jew, any, any uh, of the children of Israel, any Israelite, uh, they would have known back from Adam and Eve taught their children... You bring a sacrifice to God. And, and they didn't just tell Abel. Cain knew what to do as well. He just chose to come to God his own way. Many of the people have been trying to come to God their own way since Cain. But all of them would have always been taught from a young child they would have known. Just like when they, we preached through about the Lord Jesus as a baby. and his, at the, After the days of purification were, were complete, uh, 40 days there, the mom they brought to the temple. And they would have brought a sacrifice and they were poor. So they brought the two turtle doves instead of the lamb. All of this would have been done from their earliest age, early remembrances. Um, every year, you remember Samuel, they would go to the uh, temple, and, and every, year by year, they were going there, and she was praying, and, and year by year, asking God for a son before Samuel was ever born, Hannah was. And just all of this would have happened constantly in their life. They would have known of these things. Verse 6, sacrifice, offering. You, re re you read the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, how much talk of there of sacrifice and offerings. And it's interesting what he says. Thou didst not desire. The Lord doesn't desire that. I thought the Lord commanded us to do that. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. What, what's he saying? Well, why is he saying this? He's beginning to mature as a Christian. He's beginning to recognize God was not interested in the offering for the offering's sake. God doesn't need another bull to be killed. He didn't need a couple more turtle doves to be sacrificed. Uh, God doesn't need a few more dollars in the plate. That's not what God needs from you or wants from you. Uh, all of those things were a way God was trying to get his people to come to him. You see what he says in verse 7? Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is written in my heart. See, God didn't want people just to give a sacrifice or bring an offering. That's not what he wanted. He wanted people that would worship him. He wanted people that would obey him, that would love him, that would come to him. 
See, they figured out and realized, those that sought God, that it was in the process of the sacrifice, the process of coming to the temple, and the process of knowing their God, studying the Word, that God made Himself known to them. They began to know, began to know their God, and you'll find, it's not that just God wants you to read the Bible for reading's sake. It's not that just God wants you to go over a prayer list and call out certain words for praying's sake. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to come to Him. He wants you to spend time with Him. This is maturing that's happening. Maturation. Maturity as a Christian goes beyond a form of godliness and begins to know the God of the book. The God of all this Christianity, not just going through some motions, not just another sacrifice, not just posturing, I brought my, uh, my, my sacrifice, I brought my offering, but a performance. He's beginning to live the Christian life. He's beginning to have a life change. What performance? Well, the third thing, and I think we need to pray, Lord, how do you want to make a change, specific plans? I, I want to I meditate. I want to mature this year. I want to, thirdly, I want you to see multiplication. What performance? Multiplication. Verses 8 through 10. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O oh Lord, thou knowest. What does the Lord know about your lips? I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Now here he's saying, I have been a witness. I have told everybody, the great congregation, I have not stopped my lips. I have not uh, uh, withheld from speaking of you to people. How often will our lips have gone to complaints or gone to uh, some negative topic, or just some generic topic. We've talked about the weather or sports or other things, but we've not talked about our God. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with talking about the weather or something else that's current event, but have I talked about the Lord? Have I refrained my lips? He says, I didn't. I preached righteousness. Verse 10, I've not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I didn't hide it. I didn't keep it to myself. I didn't bury it in the ground somewhere. He said, don't light a candle and put it under, uh, under a bushel. Put it up on a candlestick. Let your light so shine that people may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, the Lord Jesus would tell us in Matthew. He said, I've not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I've declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I've not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. May, may the Lord put on all of our hearts as a resolution for the new year something in this area of multiplication. Lord, I... I want to reach a family this year. What if all of us, God put on our hearts, I want to reach a family this year. Each of us. Well, how am I going to do it? Well, it's going to start through my meditation, my drawing nigh to God, my walking with Him. It's going to start with my opening my mouth and sharing the gospel, speaking to someone. If you don't give the gospel, you'll never, never see someone saved. You have to give the gospel. It's going to start by telling being proud of our wonderful friend, our great God, the marvelous light, the one that thinks about us. So many thoughts about us that they're innumerable, he said in verse 5. If I was going to speak of them, they're more than can be numbered, his thoughts, which are to usward. The Great Commission still says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. See, maturity as a Christian is no more talking about it, no more saying, yes, we should do it, no more even just saying, I'm going to give an offering for it, but I'm going to perform. I'm not just going to posture, I'm going to have a performance of it. This is where the rubber meets the road, being sold out for Christ. I'm going to talk about Him everywhere. I'm going to use my platform, whatever that may be. Say, I've been in the hospital sick, we'll use that platform. Well, I, I have, I've just been in a little area of, of a workplace, we'll use that platform. I'm not in that area. Someone else is in the church in that area, but you're there. God's put you there. I was reading about Billy Sunday. Caitlin, for Christmas, got me a Billy Sunday book from the library. They were selling one. 17 of his greatest sermons. And uh, put out, I saw the Lord. Anyway, in the book, one of the things it was talking about was him as a, how he was a witness. And he didn't care who you were. John R. Rice shares a story of him seeing Billy Sunday meet this big CEO 
of the airlines that was flying Billy Sunday to these different places. And he said when he met and shook the hand, this big CEO, he said to him, after they met and said hello and stuff, he said, are you saved? Looked him dead in the eye, are you saved? It didn't matter if some bum on the street or some CEO of some big airlines. Billy Sunday was an evangelist and he had one thing on his mind, are you saved? Do you know the Lord is your Savior? And how often we meet people and uh, whatever your platform is or your neighborhood is or uh, where you do your business or whatever, are we using that for the Lord? Are we speaking to people about their salvation? Am I sold out for him? David was the king. He could have hired people and paid people to do that. But he said, I delight to do thy will. He said, I have preached righteousness. I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Could you say that? Boy, 2017 has gone about. In 2018, what would God have me make some resolutions in this way? Meditation. Maturation. I want to grow in Christ. As I look back from last year now, 2016 at this time, December 28th to December 28th, 2017, have I grown? Am I more like Christ today than I was then? Have I grown in Him? Have you? Are you more like Him? The Lord knows, doesn't He? He says, Thou knowest. What, what would the Lord say? In a couple weeks, we'll have our annual blessings business meeting. We'll Read off families and names of people that got saved this past year. Not all of them, but we'll read some of the different ones and the ones we see in our church family. People have been, families have joined. People have been saved and baptized. And when you hear that, that annual blessings, blessings business meeting that Sunday night, I want you to think, Lord, which, which one of these are my fruit? Which, which of these families because of my witnessing. Which of these, or next time, next year, this time, which of these will be because of my witness? The New Testament church, the Bible says that daily, says they added to the church daily, such as should be saved. And so, it wasn't just someone got saved. It wasn't even someone got saved and baptized. The Bible says they were adding to the church. Now, some are going to get saved and, and never come. I've, I've led people to the Lord and they never came to church. I hate that. That happens. Some we lead to Christ and some maybe some are out of town and there's never even a chance they're going to come to our church. But the Bible says in the New Testament, as people are being saved, God was adding to the church. And so it should be happening. So what are we going to do with our new year? Just more of the same? More sacrifices, more of this ritual that the Israelites had, I mean, they were still sacrificing all the way until they were destroyed. They still sacrificed. Even while they're sacrificing to Baal, they would be sacrificing to God. God said, I don't want your sacrifices. God said to Saul through Samuel, to obey is better than sacrifice. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't disobey the scriptures and not do what he says. They, it's not, it doesn't mean they should have stopped sacrificing, but God wanted their heart. God wanted them to do his will. He wanted them to know him, not just the token. Flipping God the tip, not just giving God Sunday. I was at church Sunday. No, no, no. It's my whole life. He... He, everything belongs to Him. He owns me. He saved me. What am I going to do next year? What would the Lord have me do? By the way, is it going to be more posturing or more sacrifices or obedience and blessing? Not just the blessing of reaching a family. That would be a blessing. You would love to come to church and see someone that, boy, God allowed me to have them get saved, start coming to church, or you knock on their door and invite them, they come, whatever it was. And boy, now they're here because of us, because of, because of me and my wife, because of me, whatever the case was. Boy, that's, that's exciting. But the blessing of knowing Him, the blessing of understanding the joy of walking with Him, 
of needing Him, of praying and seeking Him, of asking Him, Lord, I want to witness to someone. Lord, I want to see someone saved. Lord, I want to be used of You. That joy of knowing Him in a greater way. Meditation, maturation, multiplication. May the Lord use each of us this year.